Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Versa Stars Podcast. All my loyal listeners, thank you for continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Jerry Carita boards the Muller ship. You know him as the creator of Takeda Samurai, now on Kickstarter. Come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Carita. Thanks so much for coming to Versa Stars Podcast. Well, thank you, Mr. Ross. I appreciate you having me. Totally my pleasure. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for comics and who are your earliest influences? Um, so I didn't I didn't actually grow up reading comics. I grew up more watching TV. I didn't start reading comics until probably like 13 or 14 years ago. Um, and one so that I have like a weird inspiration story because I was on the set, I'm a TV producer by day. I was on the set of comic book men. So kind of tangentially, Kevin Smith was a big influence and all of his friends in the shop there you know on comic book men so walt flanagan less brian johnson because he actually didn't wasn't a big comic book reader either mike zabsik ming chen these guys were all the first people i hung out with who were very big comic book people so that was my first influence around that same time my cousin um who's a a, a, a comic book writer named james tyman uh started writing for dc right around the, right around that same time um and so i started reading all of his books and then i through that, I got hooked and I started reading all the Batman books. Um, so those are those are really my and the first comic book I read on the set of comic book men was The Walking Dead. So I've got Kevin Smith, James Tynan and Robert Kirkman. Those are my my influences of starting out. And it's only about 13 years ago. So. Well, that, that's awesome. I mean, that, that, those are some hell of a names right there. Uh, you got Smith, yeah. you got Tynan. Uh, we're going to get a couple other names that, that, that you, can, you can float out there for a little bit. But uh, when you're when you're when you're in the set of comic men, not obviously they're talking about comics, but the thing with the show is that there's a passion for the comics. How right. um addictive do they make that feeling of passion for comics? I mean, did it just kind of did you kind of just absorb it in? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I I it kind of it kind of mirrored the way I used to feel about TV and movies when I was young. So, you know, they had like funny conversations and you know, Mike Mike, there's one episode where I think Mike Zapsick talked about when Gene Gray died in the X file in the X-Men and and he um he, as a young, as a very young teenager, got really upset about it. And then, of course, it's comic book man, so everyone else kind of made fun of him about it. But, you know, I felt that way about characters on TV that I grew up watching. Mm. You know, people from, like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and stuff like that. When those characters die, you know, you kind of feel it. And so I saw their passion for it. You know, these are uh, fully grown men that are running a comic book shop and spending some time every day kind of debating all the things that I used to fight with my friends mm. about in college about, you know, does... Mm. Does the does Judgment Day in the Terminator movies have to happen, or can you? I spent I once spent four hours with a buddy of mine on a chalkboard in an empty classroom in college, just redrawing time loops and and starting points and like breaking off and branching reality and stuff like that. Um, so when I saw them doing the same thing, and you know about this universe of stories that I didn't know. I'm happy to have gotten in when I did because it's before the movies all started. Yeah. You know, like the X-Men movies were out and there were Spider-Man movies around, but like it was before, you know, before like the Marvel cinematic universe mm-hmm. and all these, the DC cinematic universe, extended universe and all that. So I kind of got in to comics right as that was starting, right when like the blade movies were coming out and things like that. So, um, you know, I started backwards. I started, I started by seeing the movies and then going back and reading the books. <laughs> now, w- w- one criticism comic books often have is the, the difficulty of um, continuity. Now, mm. has, has as someone who got into comic books later in your life, um, dived into ninety two thousands, um, especially Batman, who's a very long uh, continuity that he has right there. <clears throat> how hard is it, or was it, to dive in? um in the midst of these runs so for everything dc related i was very lucky because i didn't start by going backwards and when i started it was right when the new 52 started so they had just done a big reboot so scott snyder was doing batman james was writing um stories i think he was writing stories about alfred like where his origin story that were like B stories in the Batman books, but they had just rebooted everything. Mm. So it it was designed as a jumping on point. And so that, that you know, that, that like worked out nicely for me because I could any, you know, a lot of these characters are, 
everywhere forever so you kind of know the backstory you don't really need to see the pearls hitting the street you know behind the zorro movie theater anymore um to know that you know batman's origin story so i didn't feel like i needed to you know justify or make sense of the continuities um and then i and then i used to just enjoy going back and reading the older stories you know mm-hmm. i went back and read all the jeff Loeb stories from before that i went back and um and then with Marvel, I just kind of accepted very, very quickly that none of the continuities were going to make sense if you go back more than a couple of years. So I tried to go back and and read the original X-Men book. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time was when Bendis was doing that reboot of those original characters having been, they were brought into the present, you know? And so all those original, I'm reading the stories and like there's one thing happening and then I'm reading the the new version of the same characters and every one of those characters is like a little bit different. Yeah. Like his, his Iceman is gay and it's a totally different character and it's very different from, I'm, and I was reading them at the same time. Yeah. So that was a little, that was a little weird. And like, I would get storylines crossed in my head, but, um, but I kind of just embraced it. It's kind of like a beautiful, like mess, you know? And, 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 and that's what I kind of like about it. I kind of like that it's, it's unique. Like whenever, a creative team in a TV show or a, a movie franchise changes, everyone's just angry and everyone's mm-hmm. mad that it's not the same as the other one. Whereas in comics, it just is considered the norm. These characters have been around for 80, 90 years, some of them. So you're not going to have one person writing them the whole time. And mm-hmm. it's kind of the accepted norm that every few years, he, you know, Batman's going to become, he's suddenly going to be 32 years old again and start right. over, <laughs> you know? Um, and I kind of love that. I kind of love that. You know, my cousin's Batman was very different from Scott's and that was very different from, you know, everyone that came before that. And and they're all, they all kind of get, you get to put your stamp on it. It's very cool. You know, mm-hmm. I kind of like them. I kind of like the messiness of it all. Now, my guess is that every comic book fan has at least once and probably once is probably weekly has imagined themselves as a comic book writer. They sat right. and they said, I bet I could write a comic book. I bet I could do this. Now, most of us um, fall by the wayside. You know, we, we after the initial concept of, oh, this would be so cool. We kind of right. give up on it because we're like, eh, it's not. Eh. Yeah, you got to get a job. You got to go out and get right, a job. Right, right, right. We we, yeah. we 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 realize the complication of actually doing it, and we're like, you right. know, well, maybe next year. Next year, I'll really um, make the comic book. Um, right. But you decided you're actually going to make this a thing, yeah. um, and and you found the dedication. You're going to go all the way. So, at what point did you think to yourself, or what point did you go from, it would be cool to, I'm actually going to sit and figure out how to make this happen. I just kept listening to creators that I really respect talk about it. And like, so for the last year I've been in Scott Snyder's, um, I'm in his, I'm a Substack subscriber, one of his Substack uh, supporters. And um, so there's, a, he does like a writing workshop in there. And so I've been just for the last year, I've just been listening to him talk about the whole process and storytelling. And I, I realized, you know, I, 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 I I've done a lot of writing for television and, You know, I've always said this about different kinds of unscripted shows, unscripted reality shows I've worked Mm. on, which is that storytelling is storytelling is storytelling. It's all kind of comes from the same place. And like every every everywhere you go to tell a story or write a story, people talk about arcs, people talk Mm. about character development, people talk about where do we put the exposition and not make it feel like exposition. It's the same conversations. And I realized that with comics, um, there's I don't have to worry about budget like you have to pay for art if you want good art you know you have to right. pay for art um and you need to find someone you can work with and collaborate with who kind of gets what's going on in your head but apart from that like i can write a sci-fi epic thing about you know unicorns who um put out the sun and and there's zero special effects it's it's right. the same so you know you can kind of you're kind of unlimited in that way and i just kept hearing like scott talk about his process and how he you know you got to like force yourself to dig in and Every time anyone asks Kevin Smith about, um, you know, like, oh, you you went you went and you made clerks and you bent you know you ran up a credit card bill and it was so brave I could never do that, and he always is like bullshit. Like you you know pick up your phone. Like everything I did that I had to borrow money for, I can do on my phone now. I can yeah. record it here. I can edit it here. I can post it directly online here. Anyone can be a filmmaker if you just pick it up and do it. And so I have you know I had some stories I wanted to tell and. Um, I just started applying everything I was learning in Scott's class by listening to him and 
you know, other people, my cousin was on an episode, um, a weekly, a weekly lesson, like a guest lecturer, he calls them, uh, Kyle Higgins has been on, Will Dennis, the editor has been on, mm-hmm. um, you know, they all talked about the whole process of making comics. And I just kind of fell in love with everything they were talking about. And I finally sat down and started writing this book. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad pedigree, James Tiny and, and uh, Scott Snyder, you know, to, 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 uh, you know, on your on your resume as uh, mentors. Uh, yeah. So who was the most, the best mentor? No, just kidding. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, no, no, no. <laughs> so. No, no, no. I don't know. I don't know how to, there's no answer to that where I don't get in some trouble, you know? When, when, you're, when you're thinking about, um, once again, um, you, you started exploring um, the comic world. When do you feel comfortable enough with your ability to script? to go ahead and launch your own projects so i started i started scripting it right away um i started i probably did this backwards but i started by trying to write a rough draft of my story directly in final draft in a comic book script template that you know was shared with me by other people Mm. and that you know i know some people use and everyone uses a different there's no standard industry standard it's not like screenwriting you know for tv and movies where there's like everyone uses final draft and this is what it looks like Mm. um you can kind of write a comic book script you know, in word, with just explaining what you want to see. Um, so I just started writing it. And then I realized very quickly, I was like, yeah, I should probably take a step back from this and kind of outline it and think about what part of the story I want to tell. Because, you know, I, I know, I know a lot of what the whole first arc of the story is. And it's a, you know, a five issue run in my head. I don't know I didn't know when I sat down what part of that I wanted to tell or how I can do a short story that would introduce this whole universe without just feeling like an information dump in 10 pages. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so, but I, but I tried it right away. I tried right away and I found that a lot of it is similar to screenwriting and a lot of it is different because you're writing the script really in screenwriting, you're writing a script and then there are, you know, depending on the movie you're making or the TV show, anywhere from 50 to 500 people who are going to read the script and from the script are going to decide what the props are, what the wardrobe is, what the pacing is, where the cameras go, you know, how, what the lighting is going to be. Um, is it day or night? All those things. When you're writing a comic book script, you're really just writing that for the artist. Yeah. You know, ultimately no one's, no one else needs to see it because they're doing, they're directing it. You know, they're really the ones putting the camera where it's going to go and deciding what everyone's going to wear and what the props look like and what the lighting is. So, you know, it's, it's a little different that way because it's, it's more like a conversation and less like a legal document, you know? Mm. Um, and I learned that pretty quickly just because I've been working with two different artists and they work, they work differently. They, you know, they like, they like their scripts to be in different kinds of, one person likes the instruction, like this many panels, this is what's in each one. And then one person, I, I actually, the way we work is it's a little more loose where, you know, you can just kind of say like, the bottom of this page, I need to have the feeling that he's grabbing his weapons and rushing out of the room. In my head, it's three panels, but you're an artist. So if it's one panel where there's like that wind thing that, you, you know, like a trail of wind yeah. has already burst through the door, um, draw what you want. Draw what you think is going to look mm-hmm. nicest on the page. And, you know, she does. And I've always been happy. So it's a different, technically, technically it's a different process, but the storytelling is sort of the same. So the, the the um your 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 newest uh, your new book your your first comic book is Sakata Samurai. So from where did the concept of, for this arise? Um, uh, so it's a couple of things. One is um a cicada. The character there have been a, like the covers are online and a lot of people have pointed out he he looks a little bit like the Green Power Ranger, or like okay. another spinoff of someone in that universe, the Beetleborgs, like one of those insect kind of themed Power Rangers. Mm. Um. And, uh, you know, that's that's not intentional. Like that was completely coincidental. The character is this big. He's a cicada. He's a little, the little insects that pop up, you know, some of them come every year, but every 17 years, there's a gigantic brood of them. They make an unholy racket um, above ground. They all come out at the same time and it's, it's in the news everywhere. So this happened a couple of years ago and I got kind of obsessed. It was during the pandemic. You know, we were all bored sitting at home. So I started listening to these podcasts about cicadas, which... <laughs> exist like i was surprised too and um you know there are some there's lots of superstitions about them so i just started thinking like maybe some of those what if some of those were true and then that just was kind of buzzing in my head um and i got this idea for you know cicadas like they they're underground for 17 years they come above ground for like three weeks and then they drop dead yeah. they, they're above ground long enough to mate and die and that's it and then they go away for 17 right, right. more years so none of them are adults 
And I thought, what if one of them was an adult? What if one of them was immortal? And his job is to protect all the other ones because they're defenseless. They, they come out in the millions. They can't bite you. They couldn't hurt you if they wanted to. So they get eaten by tons of animals and insects. You know, they're just devoured. So I thought, what if one cicada has sort of like a, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer thing going, you know, a chosen immortal has samurai powers and his his job, his charge is to kind of keep an eye on all these rambunctious teenagers, you know, right up until they go above ground. And then he has to protect them long enough for them to mate so that there can be more cicadas down the road. Mm. So so then I was thinking about that scenario, right? I'm, I'm a parent. I have three kids um, and keeping the three of them alive is challenging. Um, so I thought like, okay, this is one cicada who's an adult and he's the only one with any life experience. Mm. And he has a million teenagers that he has to try and keep safe and they're teenagers. So some of them are assholes and they're not going to listen. They're not going to do what he says. So he's going to fail sometimes. And, you know, it just kind of became kind of a, a, a metaphor for, you know, a lot of the anxiety I have about my kids getting older. So mm. they're going out in the world. It's dangerous out there, you know, and you want to prepare them, but you don't want to scare the shit out of them. So, you know, you're like, <laughs> you don't, you want them to live their lives, but you want them to be careful and like live their whole life, you know? So um, it kind of became that. So, so the characters, you know, when you read the book, the narration, when he's narrating the story is very much like my voice. It's a, it's a parent who's just like these, these kids, like they're going to be, they're going to kill me, these kids, you know, <laughs> but, but then when something happens, you see, you know, he he um, jumps to action and has to protect them with his with what power he has for as long as he's alive. No. Um, and so that's the story. Now, now to dive into that um, a bit is um, once again, you said every 17 years he emerges to um, protect these um, cicada children of uh, millions of cicada children. Um, right. And he's immortal uh, or imbued with immortality imbued by whom? Um. It sort of is a mystery right now. It's the kind of thing that gets passed down. There's always one. There's always uh, you know, a, 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 one cicada who won't die of old age. It's an open question whether he can die in battle. You know, if, if he comes up against a foe and there's a foe in this story who's pretty dangerous, that could kill him, you know? Um, so it, it, that that's an open question. But he won't die of old age and it's because he the mantle is just handed down to him. And so if and when he does die, he'll have to hand it off to somebody else. There'll be a new one. So why this cicada? Why is this one chosen for mortality? Was it special about him that the other million cicadas who come out are not um, imbued with it? So I've been thinking a lot about this, actually, because this short story is about it takes place a couple of weeks before there's, there's, the cicadas are supposed to emerge. They're not, they're not supposed to be above ground yet. And two of them being teenagers decide to do what teenagers do and go out when they're not supposed to. So they go above ground, they get themselves into a little bit of trouble. And then um, he has to go and, you know, rescue them. So um, I was thinking about this because, you know, I think that the thing that makes him different is something it's like, it's like kind of like, it's a very classic superhero story in a lot of ways. Mm. So when he was young, something happened to his family, you know, that he witnessed and it changed him. These, these are kids that have and actually, you know, how kids have that thing where they think like they, they've only lived for eight years. So they think the world's going to end tomorrow. Yeah. And if you're like, no, we have to wait an hour for dessert. They, they act like that's the end of the world. Like an hour is such a long time to wait. Yes. These kids actually only have a few weeks to live. So they're, they're kind of throw caution to the wind, got to get out there and live my life for a few weeks thing is real. It's based on they're actually going to die in a few weeks. Um, and I think that, you know, like all kids, like we all have that friend who something happened in their childhood that made them grow up a little bit faster. Yeah. And kind of they kind of have a change of change of heart, change of mind. So because of something that happened in his childhood, I think he's he's in the the right place or the wrong place, depending on if you want to be immortal or not, um, to inherit the mantle. And that'll be a story that I tell in the arc. It'll be sort of a, you know, a few issues in, I want to do like a concurrent, his his origin story kind of gets to know where he came from and how the powers came to be um, while we're still telling our current story. Now, as you're talking about being um, a parent um, and the amount of responsibility it takes to be a parent, obviously the cicada samurai um, 
is going to be now the parent over um, millions of children, um, which is a, a, a huge responsibility. How does it feel about the responsibility that it has? I mean, it didn't necessarily choose it. He said it was imbued with it. Um, it did have the trauma tr- in the past, but how does it feel about now inheriting the, the pressure of trying to keep this entire civilization of millions of children going? I mean, it kind of it kind of feels like being a dad, you know, like when you're a dad, there's really there's really nothing except for, you know, a sense of duty and whether you're like a good person or not preventing you from just. You yeah. know, like, like I have three kids, it can sometimes feel like I have 50 just because they're everywhere all at once all the time. And every once in a while, it's like, you know what, I could just put I'm going to drop, put my wrench down and like piss off you know and like and and like the only thing keeping me from doing that is like a sense of duty you know what i mean like i i brought these kids into this world i should you know make sure they're not they're not they don't grow up to be useless people you know that reminds i was just watching a stand-up by uh, mike a uh, uh, briglia a uh, uh, briglia whatever his name is for biglia for biglia and he has a stand-up here one of his stand-up is I understand why dads sometimes just leave. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think to myself, and he goes, at any time, I really could just walk out the door. Nothing stops me. I'm thinking to myself, right. holy crap, that is true, isn't it? <laughs> there's even there's even like a segment of society that is like fine with that. Like, no, yeah, yeah that's what happens. You you know, he <laughs> he just it wasn't a good fit anymore. And like, you know, the wife raises the kids. It's like a crazy thing that people are okay with. Right, right. But but like, you know, the only thing keeping you from leaving is is um is a sense of duty and like your own good upbringing your own your own good you know good sense about like you know having responsibility for it and so i you know i think it i think it's like that's what i like about writing it is everything that i feel about having my my kids play tennis and basketball and one of them's in piano and golf and one of them like wants to do comic books and the other one wants to do nothing but video games and like you know they're all over the place and they go to different schools and then they have different interests on the weekends and their friends are all different in different places and it's bonkers and it's overwhelming and there are only three of them so it can feel like there's a million of them and it's never ending and so i can actually create this scenario where there actually are a million of them and it's never ending you know um and drive this character crazy and all the things that i'm feeling i can i can put in his in his heart in his brain about the whole situation um, and that's very, I got to tell you, it's very therapeutic. I think it's called, um, <laughs> I think it's called, there's a thing called repressive sublimation. Have you ever heard that term? I don't think so, but it's possible I have. I remember reading about this when they were like one of the many times when they were like, we have to get all the violence out of video games and comic books and TV shows because it's poisoning our youth, right? Yeah. There's a thing called repressive sublimation where if you play a video game that's kind of violent, you you work out a lot of the demons mm. digitally in a fake world. And then you don't go out and do something crazy in the real world you know you kind of you kind of get it out of your system and that's that's what that's what it is so i kind of it's kind of nice because i get i get some of the frustrations out by having cicada samurai say things that i can't say to my kids (laughs) you know and then and then he you know he goes on and saves their lives and i go on and drive my kids to tennis so really we're the same right well so i'm gonna ask you this question it it may come off bad but i don't mean it to be bad but i'm gonna ask it anyway so okay so the cicada samurai has a million children sort of right um you you have three um i imagine if you lose one of them that's gonna hurt you it's gonna be bad uh i'm just gonna guess i'm gonna throw that out there as just like a um i'm gonna i'm gonna make i'm gonna hazard that guess now yeah that's a fair that's fair yeah yeah so the the cicada the cicada samurai has a million the odds of all a million surviving um within two weeks without being killed and anything else is probably low he's gonna he's gonna lose a certain percentage psychologically how is it affect him knowing that no matter how hard he tries his mission is never gonna be 100 complete i mean there's a good chance for hopefully for you that you're all three kids make it to adulthood make it past you you know hopefully three for three congratulations a million for a million probably isn't going to happen so right. how does he cope with the realization that he's going to lose some of this battle i mean it's just it's just a tragedy and you kind of have to keep going through it because you have other kids to worry about so you kind of have to you know, it's, it's, again, it kind of mirrors real life. And I think you're saying that like three out of three is a good possibility. I, I know a lot of families of three or four kids, you know, four where there's one, they don't, they all don't talk to and mm-hmm. it's because that one, that one kind of went off the deep end and got, got wrapped up in some stuff they shouldn't have gotten wrapped up in. Yeah. And um, you know, that, and that's, it's always tragic, but you still have two, two or three other kids there and you have to get up in the morning and take care of them. 
mm-hmm. and continue to do your best, you know, to the best of your ability. So uh, I think it's heartbreaking for him. It's also, if you think about it, right, he, so he's been around for a little over 100 years. He's lived through six broods so far when when this story picks up. So this is his sixth brood. So he's been around for like, I think I did the math once, it's like 102 years. Um, but that means that some of these, some of these teenagers running around are like his great, 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 great grand nieces and nephews. Mm. So they're family. He's watched his family grow up and die over and over again. And like his job isn't even, it's such a weird job because like as a parent, you keep your kid alive and then you hope that they live another 50 to 70 years after they're, yeah. after you're not in charge of them anymore. These cicadas are going to be dead in two weeks anyway, but it's yeah. still a tragedy. You know, they're, they're, they're all going to die in two or three weeks anyway but he still has to keep them alive. Otherwise the species goes kaput. Right. And right. so he's, it's all the same evolutionary love for your kids kind of that he gets, you know, he has to take care of them because otherwise they all die. Everyone mm. dies, you know, it's kind of a crazy thing. Um, so yeah, it's tragic and he's, and he's lonely a lot. And, you know, for a lot of his years, he's just sitting there underground babysitting a million little, little brats and just waiting <laughs> waiting to pick up his sword and do something useful and like and honestly even that i felt that way when my kids were little when my when my baby when my first son was born you know he was the only child my wife's body literally transformed in order to feed the child and by comparison i was not important i was not part of the equation so for years you're just like what do you need how can i support you honey you're like you're not really necessary as a dad you know like physically, biologically, like you're not, you're, you're necessary for procreation, but you're not necessary to have the kid like eat and, and live. So it's kind of a weird mental thing. And so for years, he just sits underground babysitting millions of babies that don't need him. And then one day he has to pick up his sword and defend all of them. It's crazy. Mm. <laughs> and it, it kind of, it also kind of mirrors, you know, a lot about being a dad. So got it. I didn't realize how psychological this whole story was. <laughs> I was like, I had, I had, I knew, I knew I was writing it about from the perspective of being a dad, but like, we're, we're getting pretty in depth into it. And I'm like, wow, it actually keeps, it works even better. The deeper into the analogy <laughs> you go, it just keeps getting better. I like it. Now, now the, the one thing that we, 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 we touched, just hit on a little bit is the idea of um, a worldview. Um, we, we talked about how kids, especially kids have a very, short world view of of things which is why they make bad decisions that they make because they're only thinking like a day ahead an hour ahead that they don't have that whole thing where it's like we're like oh so you know it's, it's a couple of it's, you know um like I, I teach a school it's like you know in two years you're gonna graduate from high school you're gonna end up in you know a college of the world it's like two years might as well be a freaking lifetime for all they know he's like yeah it's two years right. i'm not worried about two years but as a 43 year old man two years is just like you know it, it's like that happens fast you realize how quickly that occurs and everything else it changes how you approach your life and your existence, especially as humans, we live to be hopefully 70 something years old. Now, the cicadas live for two weeks. Their worldview is going to be impacted by the fact they only live for this short window of time. So how does that, um, once they emerge, how does the fact that they only had this two weeks affect their worldview on things? I mean, they're, they view their two weeks. They've been, they've been alive for 17 years, but they've been in caves underground. Mm. So these two to three weeks are like their, I think I've been thinking of it as like their prom. Like if you're in high school, you know, if you're, you've lived your whole life under the thumb of your parents and these teachers, and then at some point you turn 18, you know, and, and you are an adult technically, if not mentally, and, and you can, you can do what you want now. And, and so, you know, that's it. This is like, they know there is no tomorrow. So they're going to do what everyone does on prom night. They're going to make bad decisions. They're going to just party and live it up as much as possible and hope that they live through it. And, and, you know, he has to, and, and, and his and he's going to do what parents do on prom night and try to make sure that the limo driver isn't drinking and and, you know, and things like that. And, you know, um, yeah, so so it, it definitely affects them because all they have in, in front of them is the thought of like, this is a big party for us. Yeah. We're finally going to go out in the sunlight and see the up, upstairs world for the first time. And it's only going to last for a short period of time. And we, and we have to party because that's what we're here for. Mm. Um again, like teenagers. So it, it kind of, it kind of mirrors that in a lot of ways, but yeah, their, their worldview is definitely one of like, you know, carpe diem because there's no, there is no tomorrow. Mm. So, and, and, and as you talked a little bit about in your uh, campaign, um, is that the, the cicada samurai, he's fighting murder hornets, uh, hungry giants, things of that nature. Um, so how deep into the horror aspect are you leaning into? 
and how do you balance the heart of this kind of family story with the horror of cannibal murder hornets eating all these babies yeah so there's um it's kind of like you know when you when you're when you have your kids and you're trying to tell them about the world and and trying to warn them about things that will hurt them you know when they're growing up you want to warn them but you don't want to scare them to the point where they can't live their lives and they're paralyzed Mm. by it and it it kind of is that you know he has spent these 17 years prepping these kids for going above ground and trying to get them to just get to the point where they could go and climb into the treetops and mate and just make sure the species keeps going on and that's been his focus um so so you know you want to try and warn your kids without scaring them into thinking that that things are horrible and scary and that they can't live their lives but but what's nice about comics and and art and the fact that it's like anthropomorphic bugs fighting these gigantic monstrous ravens and cicada killing hornets and praying mantises and you know badgers and foxes and all these gigantic monstrous looking things to these little tiny bugs um is that you can kind of turn the danger up to an 11 so like Mm. where we tell our kids no no no, there are monsters in the world in this book there are actually just monsters in the world and if you're not careful you're going to get eaten by one of them and that's kind of true in life you know it's Mm. just in the comic you can kind of make it really horrible and really scary um you know and I, i i again watching watching a lot of things like buffy the vampire slayer you spend a little bit of time getting to love a character and then it's so much more crushing when something awful happens to them yeah and that's horror and it's gut-wrenching and then they have family who have to cope with it so you can kind of tell all those stories at the same time you know if you're if you're if you're spending a minute getting to know the characters you can Mm -hmm. really feel it when something horrible happens and then you can have a horror story that's also heartfelt and sort of has a family you know family feeling underneath it all so as far as the, the creating the tension you actually have you like say the immortal cicada samurai who we don't know can even die in battle um how do you maintain tension within your story because once again you have the, the teenagers who are meant to die and cicada who may not so we're so how do you keep that tension alive well so he's sort of like um you know, again, it's sort of like in a lot of ways a classic superhero story. So if you think of him as, you know, Superman, this is like a criticism a lot of people have had about Superman. He's immortal. He's basically a god. He can't die. You know, when he dies, they bring him back like a little glimmer of sunlight and he's fine again. Um, you know, even if even if the Cicada Samurai can't ever die and is immortal and is like infallible and it, it will never lose a battle, um, we'll just get, we'll get, we're going to get to know the kids, mm. you know, and, and they have a lot at stake. They have a, a brief window to live a life. Mm. And if it gets snuffed out, as soon as they come out of the ground, that's going to be tragic. And that's going to mm. be, you know, that's, there's a lot at stake there for them. Um, You know, and if I, if I do my job, I think telling the story that, that, that you kind of, you know, as a parent, you kind of feel that way about your kids. Like if your kids don't, you know, make the team at school, you feel for them, you right, know, right. And so he'll feel for them. He'll feel for the ones that don't make it. And he'll feel for the ones that that do. He'll hope that the ones that do make it make the best of their time. Um, it, it'll ultimately all be out of his control, apart from keeping them physically safe where when he can. And he will fail at that often. Mm. Um, but, you know, there, there are going to be other characters. Like, he has to protect somebody. You know, so we'll, we'll get to know this crop of cicadas. Um, and, and uh, you know, a fair number of them are not going to make it. So um, right now it's live on Kickstarter for the, the time of this airing, and when it's released, this will still be live on Kickstarter. So can you kind of hit some of the uh, um, award uh, for yeah. rewards for backers that are really cool? Um, are we talking about stretch goals here? What, what have we got going on? So I decided actually not to do stretch goals because um, I hit my. I was very lucky. I hit my funding goal very quickly, and rather than rather than try and dangle something in front of backers and try and get more people to come on board i just wanted to thank everyone who already was on board and kind of make it a cooler package so everything i was i was was making a list of stretch goals and then i just said forget it i'm gonna just put all this in the book now Mm. um because i don't i didn't have a ton of them anyway and you know i i I started to feel like i've i've backed a lot of books on kickstarter um and like how many stickers and bookmarks do people need you know so i was like i don't want to print something else that they're not really going to most of them are not going to appreciate so instead what i did was it's a 10 page story it was an eight page story as soon as i hit my funding goal one of my stretch goals was i was going to make it a 10 pager so now it's a 10 pager 
the 10 page story. Um, it's going to print as a 24 page book. And the rest of the book is I'm running a competition that actually ends tonight um, for up and coming artists to draw the character, post it on Instagram, tag me, tag Thorny Comics, hashtag Cicada Samurai. And um, I was going to pick my favorite four, five, six of them, um, pay the artists, you know, publish it in my book. Um, so, you know, I was trying to give you know, up and comers an opportunity, like just like me, to kind of publish, publicize themselves, get published mm -hmm. and get paid. And uh, I would print all those in the book. So there's extra art that's coming your way in the book. And then um, I'm going to do I'm gonna fill out the rest of the 24 pages with script, the original script pages, pencils, sketches, inks, the colors without, you mm. know, without lettering um, and just kind of a behind the scenes look. It's kind of what, what on Kickstarter is often a PDF deluxe version. Mm. So that's what it'll be. It'll be a deluxe version. Um, but everyone gets the deluxe version though, automatically. So between um, which dates is this running? it's uh running now and it will end on october 13th at midnight so that's friday friday the 13th at midnight very nice nicely timed <laughs> yes yes that is yes. awesome <laughs> yeah um and some of the rewards so i i got really lucky with artists um i reached out to people i love and respect and and i just i got a couple of really great people on board the original character designs were done by takashi okazaki who created afro samurai you know, which is like a big manga and anime project that everyone everyone knows what it is. I don't need to say what it is. Um, I literally hit him up on Instagram, and he was into it. And that, like, that's that's how that happened. I, mm -hmm. I didn't drop any names. I didn't go through an agent. I sent him a message on Instagram. He must be using Google Translate to read it. Um, and he wrote back and said, "Dude, cicadas are a big thing in Japan too. I'm into it. Let's do it." So he cool. did my he did the first pass. He's so busy, so it took a long time to get all the all the character designs and he's and he couldn't do the interior pages because he's he's always got like four animation projects going he just did a star wars book for marvel and and um, it's called visions and then he did he's, he has some other project going now called numb which looks really weird and cool um but so he couldn't do the interior pages but he did my original character designs then i reached out to another artist on instagram that i was following her name is mary landro um she is young very young she's in fact getting married right now so she's out of out of touch for the next couple of weeks and um she um has a kind of a style that is sort of it's not manga it's a little bit more anime um it looks like an animated series but it's very cool loves drawing monsters she's very talented i reached out to her on instagram and she had a an opera window of opening and and that worked out um and then i wanted so she did two covers so the, the standard cover which is ten dollars is is her cover and that's the one that's like the one you see most if you look up the campaign i took takashi's character design we had it colored um and that's another that's another cover um mary did a second cover that's uh the cicada cicada samurai fighting the raven that he fights in this issue so you kind of get a sense for the first time of the perspective that he's this big in the raven's mouth it looks like the poster for the meg you mm. know the shark movie that's what it looks like it's very cool um and then I reached out to Walt Flanagan, who, you know, was one of the stars of Comic Book Men, one of the guys in sort of Kevin Smith's orbit from that. From He used to do, um, he was an artist for Kevin when Kevin wrote for DC back in the day. So he did Batman, Cacophony and Widening Gyre. He created a few comic book series that are, um, some of them were actually tied to Comic Book Men. He's the star of the Tell Him Steve Dave podcast, um, which is huge. And uh, so I reached out to him and I asked him if he wanted to do a cover. He loves like old universal monsters and really violent, graphic, violent, gritty, violent things that look like people tearing each other from limb to limb. So his version of the character is the least cartoony. Yeah. You know, like her version is anime. His version, uh, Takashi's version is a little bit more manga. And then, and then, and it looks a little bit more like a butt, little buggy character. Walt drew just a full-grown gritty samurai grizzled man like on a blood-soaked beach just tearing his enemies limb from limb with weapons and there's blood and beheaded characters everywhere it is glorious and um I'm I'm I was very like lucky because he I again I asked him I'm like you want to do this and he was like yeah and like a week later he had sketches in my inbox like he's so good and so like such a professional and just like again was into it and i got lucky so those are the main things and then the only other then there's like combinations you can get mary's two covers you can get all four covers all those normal things and then the one other thing we have is um 
Mary has a company where she prints cover art onto or any comic book art really onto sheets of metal so you know it's confusing because a lot of kickstarters will have like metal covers or foil covers it's not that it's you can pick the, the cover art of your choice and she will laser print it onto like a tenth of an inch thick sheet of aluminum and it'll ship directly from her to you oh, that's and awesome. so we got them in, we got that in two sizes i think we did 11 by 17 or 24 by 36 so you can get a really big one it makes awesome wall art she's been going to cons in all over canada and and like selling out of them constantly so um i just wanted to kind of put that in there if i could is i've, I've never seen that on a kickstarter so that sounds awesome that's yeah, absolutely awesome thanks mr Krita, it's been thank you appreciate it